to, you know, Bye. yes, <laughs> live on forever on the internet. All right. right. So we're not. That's not what today's show is about. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's in any other books, books. I don't know. We'll find out. Good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, uh, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar where we share um, anything that may be of interest to libraries. Uh, Encompass Live is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can always go to our website and see all of our archives. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where those are. Um, this we have quite a huge, a large archive. Actually, this is the uh, tenth year of Encompass Live. I, I did math figuring out. Um, so this is the beginning of our tenth year. So we have nine years worth of archives, um, which is great. Although that does mean that some of our things on there are um, could be potentially outdated or his, we call them historical. Um, we are um, librarians, so we save everything, so it is an archive. So pay attention to the dates and things when you do watch our archives and realize that something we did five years ago might not be you know, as up to date as you might want it to be. And that's okay. Um, well, we do make sure things here on Encompass Lives, interviews, book reviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products. Uh, really, the only criteria is that it is something library related, something libraries are doing, something that we think they should be doing or could be doing, uh, some new service or product we want to share. Um, we bring in guest speakers uh, sometimes from outside the library commission to share their expertise from both other libraries around Nebraska or and outside of the state. Um, but we also have uh, library commission staff that do presentations. And today's is actually all commission staff. Hey. Um, <laughs> we have, um, there's five of us here, and I'm actually participating today. I'm not just host, I'm a <laughs> presenter. Um, and uh, I'll let you, as, as each person goes first, I'll just be you a brief introduction to yourself and get to your, your first um, book that you're talking about. Um, but um, here at the Nebraska Library Commission, three and a half years ago, is what it said on your post? Yes. Here, we started this Friday Reads uh, program, which uh, many people have been doing um, across the internet on Twitter or other social media type place things, is just sharing a book title on Twitter, just be like, Friday Reads, here's what I'm reading now, or here's some cool book I thought you might want to know about. Um, your library commission, our previous continuing education coordinator, uh, Laura Johnson, this is retired from the commission, and she started a program having commission staff uh, write blog posts about books that they had read or books that they were, thought was interesting, books they wanted to share. Um, and it has been going strong since then. Um, since uh, when Laura left, Amy on here, um, she took over scheduling us, getting more people and new staff, yeah. uh, some newer staff yes. on board. They corner you. <laughs> yeah, when you first start, they corner no. you. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have quite a large group of here that do um, um, post um, every Friday. There's a blog post, one of the blog posts on the commission website about a book that we read. So um, we did a re um, Amy actually posted a year review um, on a uh, graphic about that. We've been doing this for the last year, and so we decided to share some of the titles we wrote about this year. Um, this is not everyone. We're not going to do 52. No. no. We have 10 titles <laughs> to share with you today. So this is a small selection of what we, um, an excerpt, a small selection of what we did. But um, go to our website. As we actually tag all of these Friday reads so you can find all of them. And they actually also set up a separate web page that you can go to that collects all of the reviews in one place as well. Yes. That you can browse and search and see what um it's I that's actually I thought it was cool separated by fiction and nonfiction yes. too. Yes. So if you have a certain um type of book you like to read, you can check that out too. So um let's get started. And I am actually up first. These books are actually in order of when we actually posted them throughout the 2017. So starting from January through December. Um, and I happen to be the first one in January. Um, had this idea. Yeah. I didn't realize it would be with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. So, um, my first book for this is Star Wars Bloodline by Claudia Gray. Um, Claudia Gray is an author who does a lot of um, science fiction and a lot of these kind of um, novels based on Star Wars and other um, genre 
type things. Um, I like a lot of the writing. Um, this particular one is, as you can see from the cover, it's um, right there is General um, General Leia Organa from Star Wars is on the cover, and this is about her. Um, I am, as I wrote in my post, a member of the original Star Wars generation. I saw the original movies before they were numbered, before it was one, two, three, before they had subtitles when they first came out in the theater. My parents took me and my sister to see Star Wars. Not Star Wars, A New Hope. <laughs> it wasn't that yet. It was just a new movie, Star Wars. And I um, fell in love with the whole series and specifically Queen's Leia and some of the, more, uh, the other characters. One of my favorites. Um, strong, independent, rebellious <laughs> woman. Uh, uh, and I just connected with her for some reason. Um, this book is actually part of a new series of novels that are being published in conjunction with the new films um, that are coming out. Um, for good or for bad, when Disney purchased Lucasfilm in 2012, they declared that um, anything written um, previously was now considered non-canon by Disney, which means, as far as they are concerned, any of those stories that were written outside of the movies, um, books and novels are written that tell other stories, are no longer canon, which means they're not part of the history anymore. There's a big controversy about that, of course. People who love those previous books don't like that. But... It is what it is. Those books still exist. You can read them if you want to. But they're starting new stories, and this is part of that. Um, and bringing the storylines in continuity with the new movies that will be coming out. Sometimes it's hard to match up with a movie from 30 years ago and a book written 20 years ago, and then write a new movie. And they say, let's just start fresh. So. Um, Bloodline actually takes place between Return of the Jedi, the last of the first three movies that were um, done. And The Force Awakens, which is a new movie that just came out two years ago. Yes. Yeah. So there's The Force Awakens, then Rogue One, and then just last month, um, The Last Jedi, which I just saw this weekend. Awesome. Anyway, it takes us between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens so you can find out what happened in between those times. At the end of Return of the Jedi, we beat the Empire, yay. Yeah, it doesn't mean every, there's peace in the whole galaxy, though. There's still controversy. There's still... Um, espionage, there's still things happening with politics going on, and this tells you what happens um, with um, Princess, with General Leia, and how um, leading into The Force Awakens, so it helps you learn a little bit more about what happened, um, how the Resistance was formed, um, the origins of the First Order, and if you're Star Wars, you'll get all this, but it helps you, you know, give you a little introduction of what is going to happen in The Force Awakens. Um, you also find out where Leia is given another um, title, the Hut Slayer. Do you oh. remember in the original movie, she actually killed Jabba the Hut, and to some people, that was awesome. And she is now revered by some, um, and you learn about that that she they look up to her for that she got rid of this um, horrible thing. Which is kind of cool. um, there's also a brand new book. Also, I want to mention following up this called Leia, that also written written by Claudia Collette Gray, that takes place. Um, before, um, when she was like a teenager and becoming um, princess before the um, first movies. So that's another one. I have not had a chance to read yet, so that's another. So that's my, my first book. Um, if you're into Star Wars or just into fast-paced espionage, politics, this is got all of that in there. Next is, that's my play. Yes. Um, my name is Susan Nice, and I work in the Technology Nexus Services Department. And uh, early on in 2017, I read a book called How to Survive a Play, The Inside Story of How Citizens and Science Came to the um, The way I got to this book is I had watched Dallas Buyers Club, uh, finally, um, mm -hmm. and the Matthew McConaughey character, uh, was really striking to me, and I always can tell I'm a research geek because one of the parts I loved best was when he first went to the library and started researching mm -hmm. AIDS. He wasn't willing to just accept what the medical community was telling him, and he's you know, digging through indexes, pulling up reports, and I just think that's so great. Um, 
So I wanted to know more about that. I knew that groups like ACT UP had been really involved in the whole science of um, uh, trying to find a cure for AIDS, trying to understand how it worked, um, and also the politics of the science, um, how much uh, the government was willing to fund AIDS research, um, how long clinical trials were taken, how uh, sort of stuck in certain protocols the medical community, research community was when people were dying. And so initially I was going to read um, Randy Schultz's book, The Band and the Band Played On, but that stops in 1985, no. which of course they were nowhere near no. to a cure yet. And so, you know, I think I bought a used copy of that book. I had it, but I hadn't started reading it yet. And then at the end of 2017, I think, or 26, it was at the end of 2016, uh, they had 100 notable books in 2016, and this book was on the list, and it had just been published, and so I knew it would take us up to present day, so we would actually make it to the point where they found treatment that would allow people to, that made AIDS manageable mm -hmm. for many people. So I decided to read that and, um, that book instead. Um, things that were really striking about this book, um, where it really follows ACT, that the ACT UP group in New York. Um, and I think what struck me was how many people were involved, how passionate they were, how many different directions they wanted to take their activism in. So you had people who were really involved in you know, demonstrations and die-ins and putting up posters and um, you know, unfurling banners at the New York Stock Exchange. I think one group uh, actually enclosed Jesse Holmes's house in a giant condo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so there were these people who were really brash and in your face. Um, there were other people who were um, looking for treatments, other people uh, who really wanted to advocate for the uh, research for treatments, other people who were, you know, looking for social services to help people um, who were uh, dying of AIDS. And the one thing that struck me is how much conflict there was within the group and between activists, mm -hmm. which really stuck with me that notion that you can have all these different people who have the same goal, who are so passionate, but they all have different ideas about what the best way to mm -hmm. work towards that goal is, and they can just be vicious with each other in terms of uh, you know, accusing each other of jeopardizing or sabotaging efforts. You know, if, if you pursue this path, it's going to undermine our pursuing this other path, and you're going to you know, give us a bad name, or you're going to, you know, you're wasting your time doing this. And, you know, by the time I got done with the book, my, my feeling was it probably took all of these different efforts, all of these different directions. And, you know, you see this even today in terms of activism, people fighting with themselves and disagreeing. And in some ways, looking at it from that perspective is sort of the idea, you know, these groups and everyone, they need all these different people working at all these different things at once. One thing that really struck me though was the small group that really focused on, you know, National Institute of Health, CDC, drug trials. You have this one young woman who just sort of started showing up at meeting. She was like 17, she was a high school dropout. She and some other people were really interested in science. There was also sort of a middle-aged woman who had a PhD in chemical pharmacology or something who, you know, suddenly just showed up from the suburbs and sort of attending these meetings. Um, and they formed this little, what they call science club, this study group. And they researched and they found out everything scientifically they could about uh, the disease, about treatment, about virology, about um, how clinical trials were conducted. Um, this one woman is like 17. <laughs> and, yeah. and you know, they basically researched the whole sort of bureaucratic uh, corporate reporting structure of all of the government agencies that were dealing with AIDS 
to the point where they understood it better than the people who were working there. And eventually, it took a long time, but eventually, they were actually able to consult with and participate in some of the structure and how they were going to make changes in the way they pursued uh, treaties. You know, they ended up going to international conferences. And, you know, there was a picture in the book. This woman is 21. <laughs> and she's at this international women's conference. Right. You know, of course, there are you know, these oddball uh, people in their <laughs> late teens, early 20s, and you know, living shoulders with internationally renowned scientists, and they're being listened to. So, anyway, um, the only sad thing about the book is, of course, as you go along, you know that some of the people that you get to know aren't going to make it. So, that was one of the hardest things as you went through the book. The other thing that was really striking was at the very end. Um, you know, suddenly they have this treatment in 95, 96. So all of this effort sort of comes to a stop. Mm -hmm. At least the intensity goes away. And so you've got all these activists who spent their, you know, spent their late teens, early twenties working towards this. And suddenly they have no purpose anymore. Mm -hmm. They didn't go to college. They didn't think they were going to live. So, you know, they devoted what they thought were the last couple years of their lives towards this effort. Now they're going to live, but they have. But they do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of depression, a lot of drug addiction. Mm -hmm. um, with this almost PTSD. So anyway, yeah. I probably have to get them up. Okay. Next. Allison. Oh, right. me. Yes. It's just that. Um, so I'm Allison Badger, and I actually work with Susan in Tech Access. Mm -hmm. and. I'm a cataloger, and I, this wasn't the first thing I wrote for um, Friday Reads. I wrote something else first, but I, I chose The House of the Spirits by Isabel Allende. Mm -hmm. um, it's a book I first read in high school. Uh, it was introduced to me by my international um, literature teacher, and um, and I just I fell in love with the book and the story and Allende's her writing style and of course the characters. Um, Allende writes very strong, passionate female characters, and um, so yeah, I've read this probably a dozen times in the twenty years since. And every every time I read a, a book, I reread a book. I learn I learn something new about the characters, or I learn something new about the story. Something new jumps out at me, and so this book. Um, I think they never specifically states where the story is set, but um, she's from Chile originally, and so it's always kind of assumed that the book, the story takes place in Chile. And it kind of st starts out in the early 20th century um, with a very wealthy family, and um, there's this, this boy who wants to marry, and marry one of the daughters, but he literally has nothing. He's very poor, and so he kind of he goes out and he buys some land he becomes a gold miner and he makes his fortune and you know and marries this woman clara deval the ball and um clara is rather eccentric and she has some kind of um she can predict the future she can kind of move things around it's kind of this book has elements of magical realism in it which is probably what I really liked when I was 17, 18 years old was the magical realism. And so the book, the story is of um, Esteban and Clara and their children and how they interacted with kind of the social and political upheaval that was going on in a lot of Latin American, South American countries um, during the middle of the 20th century. And um, and I think, you know, it, in some ways it's a very dark story. Some very bad things happen. And, but what really struck me the last time I read this book was it concludes on a very hopeful note that even though, um, you know, Esteban's granddaughter has experienced truly some of the worst things you can experience in life. She's been in prison, she's been tortured, she's been raped. And she comes out of prison and she still has a lot of hope. She still thinks, she thinks things are going to get better, that this is just kind of, you know, it, it's gonna pass. And I, I found that very inspirational, that you know, this, this character, this woman who has truly experienced 
probably the worst of humanity is still saying things are going to get better. I have hope. And I just, I just thought, you know, um, that's something that we can all really learn from and take to heart. Good. <laughs> <laughs> ish ending. It. Yes, it's, it is. It's, you know, like I said, she, she has hope that, mm -hmm. you know, things are going to get better and she's kind of taken in briefly by a very poor family who has nothing, but they're sharing what they have mm -hmm. and they have hope and she just is like, yeah, things are going to get better. I have hope. All right. All right. Where Amy, that's mine. Uh, my name is Amy Owen. I'm on the reference team. If you call the library commission, you might be talking to me. I'm on the desk quite a bit. Uh, and my book is a little different. Uh, I read a lot of the same books that Sally reads. <laughs> Picture books, chapter books, books for elementary school kids. And this book, uh, Miss Bixby's Last Day by John David Anderson, uh, is about three sixth grade friends who ditched school to visit their favorite teacher in the hospital. Um, Steve, Topher, and Brand, they're in sixth grade, should be their last year of elementary school, everything's great, and their teacher, Miss Dixby, she's one of the good teachers, they really lucked out. Uh, she, uh, she's the kind of teacher that's got pink streak in her hair and she moonlights as a clown. <laughs> uh, but she also really listens to her students and gets to know them and what makes them special and what makes them tick. And each of these boys has a very special bond with her. Well, then they get the sudden news that Ms. Bixby is sick and she's not gonna be able to finish off the school year. So um, they're gonna throw her a goodbye party with her class and uh, everyone's looking forward to it. But then she's actually too ill to attend the party and she's hospitalized before the party takes place. So these boys decide that she can't come to the party. They're going to bring the party to her. So they construct this elaborate plot to gather all her favorite things and skip school and go to the hospital to have a party with their teacher. So they, they've constructed this really detailed scheme, but of course they run into every imaginable obstacle. And in, they're very realistic obstacles. I, I thought, you know, I have a son. This is the sort of trouble that you dread your middle school day. <laughs> <laughs> but you can totally imagine these things happening. So I don't want to ruin any plot points for people who are going to read it, but just every, at every turn, something goes terribly wrong. Um, but they do eventually get to the hospital and get to see their teacher. So it's a very character driven book. You really get to know each of the boys and why they had uh, such a bond with their teacher. Um, there's Topher, he's the artist, he and Ms. Bixby bonded over his drawings. There's uh, Brand, who cares for his injured father, and Ms. Bixby, you know, sees him one day walking to the grocery store, and they start going grocery shopping together. He's really taken a lot of responsibility on at home, and, and so she, you know, makes him feel that's okay. And then there's Steve, who is in the shadow of his big sister, but Ms. Bixby lets him know that he's, he's good enough also, you know, he doesn't have to live up to what she has done. Uh, it's told in a first-person narrative, but from each boy's perspective, so you kind of get an inner reading of the story. So um, they alternate the chapters so that each boy's experience is told. But as one boy is thinking something's great, the next boy is thinking it's the most horrible <laughs> thing ever. They're going to get busted, get in trouble. And another one might be thinking, I've already been there and done. Why do you have to go It's an incredibly moving and sad story because their teacher is very ill. And that each boy's been through a lot, both personally and with her. Um, but there's also a lot of humorous. It's very funny. Mm -hmm. right. Sally, I think I think turn. Yes, this thing's been what's a wonderful yes. book. Yes, I'm going to read completely. Read. Oh, I'm Sally Snyder. I'm the Children and Young Adult Services Coordinator for the Library <laughs> Commission. Just in case you didn't know that. Um, the first book I'm going to talk about is Restart by Gordon Corman, and many of you, if you're familiar with uh, middle school and high school books, will recognize Gordon Corman's name. He's been writing ever since he was in high school, and he's been very popular for years and years. But in this book, Chase, who is in eighth grade, wakes up in the hospital and he remembers nothing of who he is. Who are these people standing around him looking at him? He doesn't recognize his family. He remembers nothing. He knows how to read. He can walk and talk and everything, but he can't remember anything personal about himself or why he's in the hospital. And you don't know, as the reader at first, what happened. Um, but then um, 
He goes back to school, it's completely unfamiliar to him, but he begins to notice that as he walks down the hall, other students are cringing away from him, and he isn't the one, because he doesn't remember anything. These two fellow burly fellows come up to him, and they are apparently his best friends. He has been the eighth grade team quarterback, and they are on the team with him, and they are great buddies. And slowly he learns that he has been the reigning bully of the school. And he has encouraged his best friends to be bullies too. And nobody's stopping him because he's the eighth grade quarterback. Plus, they're pretty sneaky about it. So he's really puzzled by this because he's thinking to himself, how did he get that way when now, the way he is now, his impulses are to be friendly and helpful. And what should he do now? He joins the video club. Like, the death knell of the popular <laughs> 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 he wants to. And they, they don't want him. <laughs> but the teacher accepts him. And so they're like, no. But okay. <laughs> oh, what's he going to do? What's he going to do? It's so, it's, so there's humor in it. But um, he's, he's known for his humor, humorous books. But this one it takes a more serious and intriguing path. Although, obviously, there is some humor in it. And interestingly, just this morning, before our um, program, I was looking at an online journal called Teaching Tolerance, and there were a couple of articles in there. One of them was titled, oh well, I can't get them, I didn't write the whole title down, but the idea is that the boys will be boys mentality is guiding our society, and we need to get rid of that now, because it is not acceptable, and we're teaching kids in elementary school and middle school and high school that it's okay because you're a boy, and you know, when you grow up, you'll be a boy, and blah, blah, blah. No. Let's just stop that. And I thought, wow, that really connects with this book and this boy who really was caring about people and his best friends. Keep trying to get them to be the old guy, and he's not really interested in it. It's a wonderful book, of course. I don't think there is a bad Gordon Foreman book, so <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, next. Oh, that would be me again. So Jane Austen is one of my favorite novelists, favorite writers. And Pride and Prejudice is actually my favorite book. But that's not the book I'm talking about. I'm going to talk about my <laughs> Mansfield Park. And I, I say all of that because until the last time I read Mansfield Park, again, this is a book I've read numerous times, I really didn't like this book. This was probably one of my least favorite Austen books. And part of it was the main character, Fanny Price, she just drove me absolutely insane. She's this, she's the poor relation taken in by her, her much richer relatives. And Fanny is just kind of, she cries a lot. She gets <laughs> sick a lot. And she's just, I, I don't know, she's just, She's not the kind of person I would probably hang out with. She's not the kind of person I'd be friends with. She's the kind of person who would really, really annoy me. And, and part of it is, you know, the family really does overlook Fanny. They just, they don't treat her very well. They impose their will on her. You know, they kind of take her for granted. They treat her like a servant. And she just kind of is like, yeah, that's cool, whatever. And, but, Probably one of the last times I read this book, I realized that no, Fanny actually does express a lot of emotion. She expresses her anger. It's just it's not a very obvious way. It's it's more internal, and you know she has moments where she does reveal to herself to actually be a very strong woman, where she digs in and is like, "No, I'm I'm, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. You you can't make me. I don't care what happens." And, and I think, you know, really what I took from this book was that Fanny really takes a lot of pleasure in kind of those small moments of life. Mm -hmm. You know, those kind of moments that we maybe don't think much of, you know, hanging out with our best friend, um, you know, or talking to, um, you know, her brother. It's, she really just genuinely feels the joy. And, and I just really felt like there's something that we could learn from that, that you, you live each moment as it is. And, um, and you, yeah, you just, as I write in my review, you know, you embrace each and every moment that life gives you. So it's interesting you mentioned that this is your least favorite 
of you know, second least to <laughs> but you kept rereading it. Yes. Why? Or do you know why? Even you know, you read it once and said, oh, I don't like it. And this is a good question just in general, but why would you go back and read it again? Because I love Jane Austen. Mm -hmm. And even though this is this is the genius of Jane Austen, she creates characters not all of us like. No. Yes. Um, Fanny is one of them. Uh, Emma from Emma is probably the other one that um, I really don't like because she reminds me too much of myself, but that's neither here nor there. And I think that's the genius. That's that's how you know someone is a really good author. Um, Gillian Flynn did it with Gone Girl. Mm -hmm. They create characters who are so unlikable. You hate them. You detest them. And yet, here you are rereading the book. That makes it interesting. Yeah. It's not boring. And, yeah. yeah. And, and you're willing to continue. You're, you're still invested regardless of the characters and how much you dislike them. So that's, mm -hmm. and, and also, when people often ask me, you know, why do you reread books, Allison? Why, why do you always reread? Mm -hmm. I say and, that a lot too, yeah. Yeah. Because it was so good the first time. Yeah. I relive it again. I, I want to, well, like you said, find things that I didn't see and the that's, first time. That's exactly what it is. I think every time I've read a book, I, mm -hmm. I gain something new. Something new jumps out at me. Or I, you know, depending on where I am in my life, mm -hmm. um, you know, I might interpret, reinterpret a character differently for, you know, this the one time, this one of the last times I read Mansfield Park. Wow, Fanny. Okay, she's not nearly as bad as I thought she was. There's there's more to her there. So it's just like you know, why we buy movies and rewatch, you know, re binge again a TV series we watched years ago. It, because she's just gonna be something yeah. new. Yeah. Plus visiting old friends. Oh well, yes, that's you. Yes. All right. Who's next? Oh, it's me again. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be coming up so soon again. All right. So, um, The Dark Tower, uh, The Gunslinger by Stephen King. This is the first book in the Dark Tower series, which is a ongoing, I mean, he still keeps writing new things randomly. Um, with the recent release of The Dark Tower movie, which was last year or sometime. Exactly. It was like August, I think. Is it okay? Because I did this in November. Um, I decided to finally start reading this series. Yes, I've never read it before. Sorry. <laughs> um, I am a big, as you can tell from the problems with many of the things, sci-fi, fantasy, that kind of um, thing are my are my good house what I like. Stephen King, he he when it gets to the horror, more horror-y stuff, I'm not too much into that. Um, I read Cujo, who didn't really like it too much, but um I decided the movie is coming out. Um Idris Elba, hello. Um, yeah, Matthew McConaughey. Hello. I was like, all right. I, but before I see the movie, I want to read the book. I'm going to be a good librarian and do it that way. So I decided to do this, and I did. And I, in my right, in my when I wrote this up, I said, um, so far I only read the first book. Actually, I'm into the second one now. I kept going um, after the first. I read the first one, then saw the movie, and then started reading the second one. Just was how it turned out. Um, and it's interesting. Um, and I'll talk about the movie at the end of this, actually, because um, this is more about the book, is what the, the whole point of this is. It just happens to be in a movie. Um, <laughs> I really liked the feel of this book because um, it was a mixture of things. It's a Western, but there's magic. Um, is it uh, far into our own future? Is it after a major apocalypse? Is it an alternate universe, an alternate history? What is it? Um, and like, as I said, this has been a series of books, and unfortunately by the end of just this very first one, you have no clue where you are or when you are. There's no clear, if you haven't realized, you might, and I don't know, so I just read recently, at the end, but I was like, are you kidding me? I have no <laughs> idea what the heck's going on. I don't know where I am, I don't know when I am, and now I want to read the next one. Way to go, Stephen King, for yeah. second again, because you did not wrap this up. You left this completely, Unsure about <laughs> what the heck is going on. Yeah, nice. You waited to read it until the second book in the series was already available. Yes, so exactly. I've done that, that before. Yes, started a new one, and I'm like, yeah. yes, no, because these, these, I know, I've got these actually all on my um, Nook app on my um, tablet, so I'm pretty to them on there, hopefully. So, um, so you don't know anything. You don't know why is Roland, the, the last, the gunslinger, chasing the man in black? They actually don't explain that in the first book. Which is interesting because in the movie you do figure these things out 
Turns out the movie is based on not just the first book, but it jumps around and pulls things from several books in the series and not necessarily all of them chronologically, which is, I confuse and upset some people too, that it wasn't just a story of here's the first book or here's the first two into a movie. It's well, actually, here's part of the first one and I'm gonna pull some of this from the third one and don't worry about the second. I'm not exactly sure I've read all of them, but I'm noticing that now that they kind of grab different bits and pieces. So, um, yeah, it's very interesting. Who is the man in black, really? Where, what is the Dark Tower? You don't know. <laughs> it's the name of the series, but, but just by the first book, I'm telling you, keep going with it. So, um, it is, a, and because of the way it's written, I think it's a bit disjointed in introducing the characters, location, the plots, I felt. Um, it felt like you'd already know something about this before reading the book, but you don't, you're kind of being dumped in in the middle of a story. Um, and it almost has an annoying non-ending. It's totally open-ended. So um, you do have to continue. If you want to know the full story, you got to keep going. But I did enjoy it in spite of all the annoyance. <laughs> I guess, it's like I said, it annoyed me, but it made me, it sucked me in. And yeah. So it was interesting to match up parts of the movie that came from the book. Um, but some sums that are in the book, they're not maybe as happens. So, um, and some things that were obviously pulled from future books in the series that I had not read. So when I watched the movie, I did get some spoilers, I, I assume, of what is what I'm going to see. But it didn't really run for me as, you know, it didn't get to that horrible. Um, so the books and the movie are different, I'll tell you that. Don't, if you've just seen the movie and you're like, oh, I want to read more about that, you're not going to have the same necessarily kind of deal. Um, but they're both good in their own right. And I think people, and I do this a lot with things, I'm, I'm a lot more forgiving, I think, than some people about, well, they didn't do it exactly right, and I am so upset, I'm never going to watch anything again. I'm more open-minded. I'm going to try it. We'll see. And they may be exactly the same. They may be completely different. Everybody has different opinions of these things, too. Um, Interview with the Vampire by Anne Rice is an example for me. The movie that was done, was exactly what was in my head when I read the book. It was so perfect, I was like stunned to me. I don't know if anyone else, other people saw some things and I was like, oh my God, they did it. <laughs> but they don't always. And this one, they did a, what I thought was a really fun and interesting movie and really cool book too, but they're not necessarily exactly the same thing. So I'm um, getting back into Stephen King right now. <laughs> I'm in the middle of the second one. Let's see. Next. Solo by Kwame Alexander. I marked this because I just wanted to say that this is a 457 page book written for teens, high school, but it's written in free verse, so there is so much white space on every page. It just kind of <laughs> into, it feels like you're really accomplishing things because you're just zooming through this book, but it's wonderful. Um, Blade, who is almost 18, he is the son of a famous rock star. But his father is now more famous for his antics when he's drunk or on drugs than his music. So um, on the day of his high school graduation, when he stood up to address the crowd, his father rode a motorcycle down the hill and right into the podium that was outside and crashed. And he's done with his father. And he's just sitting there and done. His sister, who's a little older, is still supporting his father. And she lets go a family secret that night. Uh, Blade is not, he's adopted, he's not a child in this time. Well, he is the other, his mother who had died is not his real mother, there's another lady who dead had her. So he's, he decides to go to Ghana, which is where his mother is now. She's from the United States, but she's in Ghana trying to make a difference and help people. And so he goes there to meet her, find out about himself, and really figure out who he is and where he's going. And part of all of this is music which is pretty wonderful. Um, and so it's on my summer reading program list for this coming summer with the music thing. But I haven't experienced this yet, but my friend Jill Annis told me that the audio book of this includes the music, the songs, the four songs throughout the book. And then at the end, they play the songs again, all four of them. So you kind of revisit the whole story listening to the songs again. I said, well, I have to get, I have to get that on uh, audio and, and hear that part of it. Because it is a wonderful book. Um, 
The things that he's dealing with are the death of his adoptive mother when he was 10, his father's behaviors, his girlfriend was cheating on him, he found out before he left, meeting his birth mother and the people he meets in Ghana that were very positive. And all along, he's had these nightmares that nobody can really explain, including his therapist. Nobody really knows what these nightmares are about. But it's, it's a, so look at the cathartic moments in the main curator's life and what it reveals in his true self. And it's just wonderful. Kwame Alexander is one of my favorite authors right now. And um, I can't wait for his next book. I have no idea what it, when or what it will be about. But, um, <laughs> so far, he's, I think, I'll say this, He's written in three verse. He wrote Booked and Crossover and this one. And he has been a contributor to some other collections of things, but mm. but all his writing is free. So verse. far. Now somebody will prove me wrong. And that's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know the book is written, it's not a free verse. Please let me know. I'll go find it and read it. But, um, it's a wonderful book. All right. All right, my second book is The Dirty Life. A memoir of Farming Food and Love by Kristen Kimmel. Um, Kristen is an Ivy educated journalist. She's 30 something, single, living in New York City, loves her city life. She's minutes from her sister, spends time in coffee shops and shopping, just all that the city has to offer. Um, but she's starting to feel this like, deep down, you know, longing for, for something else, for home, for family. And it doesn't make sense to her because none of her peers want this. And she thinks maybe I shouldn't want this either, but it's there. And so she's on a freelance assignment and she goes to rural Pennsylvania to interview this, this young farmer about food trends. He, uh, he runs a sustainable farm um, and uh, he's teaching other farmers and it's kind of this resurgence of local food that's going on. And uh, you know, at first, when she gets there, he's too busy to talk. So he hands her a rake and tells her to go help one of his assistants uh, in the tomato beds. And, and she's horrified by the amount of work. She's not dressed for it. She's ruining her designer clothes. <laughs> she went there thinking she looked all cool and, and she gets covered in dirt. Um, but you know, it's so filthy and so hot. And uh, But when she returns to the city, it's all she can think about. You know, the physical labor and the sunshine and the fresh air and just this intense satisfaction she's getting mm -hmm. from this place. And also the man. <laughs> <laughs> he's very intriguing. He's not like anyone she's ever met. He's got all these ideas that she, you know, she's never considered before. Um, but she can really see like a future with her. And he reveals later on that he thought the same thing, that he thinks he met her and thought, this is the person that I'm gonna marry. And if I would be so scared, I would just ask her right now. Yeah. <laughs> So she keeps finding excuses to go back to his farm, you know, write more articles, thinking maybe this would make an interesting topic for a book, and he keeps finding excuses to come and visit her. Uh, but he, he really can't uh, handle her city life. He doesn't like anything to do in the city, and, and she's very uncomfortable taking him places because he, uh, he's not quite dressed the part the city boy. Uh, so they decide they are going to uh, start a life together and go and find land and build their own farm. So this, the rest of the book is their uh, their first year together where they find uh, a plot of land and they start setting up um, his dream farm, a sustainable farm that is a CSA, a community supported agriculture model where uh, customers are gonna come and pay a membership fee and they'll get a share of the harvest all year round. And it's a unique model because it's a whole diet CSA, where they're going to get meat and, and milk and eggs and flour and all the vegetables that they want. So, uh, their first year on the farm, just getting things up and running and planning their wedding at the same time. Yeah. And uh, she, she's an incredible storyteller. You really feel like you're there. You can smell the dirt. You can feel the horses running away as she's trying to. <laughs> <laughs> You know, she's planning her wedding in the loft of their barn. Um, it's really, a really great storytelling. If you're into books about the local floor movement or uh, food writing, things like Omnivore's Dilemma or An Animal, Vegetable, Mineral by Robert Kingsolver, it's a really along those lines. And uh, I highly recommend it. I really uh, have a thing for farming, even though I would never actually do it. <laughs> I love to read about it. <laughs> Garden, yes, you? it's nice to be able to close the book and not have to get up and crack it on. Yeah. <laughs>
But I, I, what I really liked about this was that it's a love story that's not really centered so much on the love part. They really mm -hmm. do are building this relationship, but it's not the center of the story. She keeps that part very private. And I recently went back and visited their website and their blog and they now they have children and they've been doing this farm for like, you know, 15 years and it's really working out. Oh, wow. Yeah, so you really get to see more about the back of the How it actually turned out. Yeah. 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 And he's, cool. he's very cute. <laughs> <laughs> you can see why. <laughs> Okay, so we can talk oh, this about this. I think it's the last one. Yeah. yeah. It's just how it came out. Yeah. This was the one that you obviously just I did know, last just, month in December. So. <laughs> I just uh, read this one. Um, the Futurist History How the Talist Period was in Ukraine and Russia. Um, again, how I came to read this book, um, I've been. Obviously, Russia's in the news all the time now, and I'm always thinking, oh my god, I hear so much about what's going on in the world. Um, I really should read something. And then uh, this book won the National Book Award, uh, so it was, this was around right. um, November 15th, and so I, you know, those two things came together, and I said, okay, well, I'll give it a shot. Um, this was a difficult book. Um, I was reading it you know, in the evenings at like got home from work and I really had to struggle mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, there's lots of Russian names in it, um, which obviously those are the people's names, so you can't blame an author for mm -hmm. using a Russian name. Mm -hmm. um, but I was also reading it in book format, so it wasn't as easy to flip to the front where they have a little sort of a oh. list of who was who. Oh, okay. um, yeah. So, you know, sometimes I would get uh, confused about this person was this this person or was this this person? Um, but again, it's one of those books I plowed through it, um, and I'm really glad I did. I feel like it's one of those books that's going to stay with me. Um, she basically covers 30 years of uh, the last 30 years of Russian history. So she starts out. Um, she's got about seven people that she focuses on, which again that is one of the challenges with because we're trying to keep track of. Um, so four of the people were born in the mid-80s, so she wanted people who were born before the fall of the Soviet Union, so they were kind of uh, just becoming a coming of age in the 90s when uh, uh, the Soviet Union was no more, and that this was the era where everything was kind of crazy and everything was unsettled, but there were new freedoms, there were new possibilities, but there was also lots of crime, there was, there was awful inflation, there was a lot of chaos. And then in uh, 1999, 2000, the Putin came into power again, and then things started gradually getting uh, more uh, authoritarian again. Um, so she kind of wanted to look at, at people who had come of age during this period of time. Susan, were these like just kind of normal, everyday? I don't know if you would say they were normal, everyday people. Okay. Um, you know, she talks a little bit about how she chose them, but I mean, they all had sort of unique okay. uh, backgrounds. One was the, you know, child of, uh, uh, you know, several of them were children of people who were really involved in politics. Okay. Um, another one uh, was an academic, you know, became an yeah. academic. So, you know, I don't know that they were exactly two. Um, no, probably not. They all, basically all of them you know, were really involved in what was going on, and some of them were no longer able to live in the, uh, Russia, they had to leave, so in, in that way, I'd say they're not, yeah. they're not just yeah. <laughs> the people who are going on in their lives. Um, so uh, she also followed three academics who were a little older. And what was interesting about them is they were adults and they were actually in sort of their professional careers in the 80s. So one was a psychoanalyst, one was a sociologist, and one was sort of an independent philosopher who was self-educated. But what was really striking was just how close off uh, their uh, world was in terms of like the psychoanalyst, for instance. You know, they really didn't have a lot of interaction with the Western world of uh, psychology, and so 
you know, we have all of these developments and different schools and different classes and this intellectual framework, and, and she didn't have access to that. So then we finally, in the late 80s, early 90s, things started opening up, and then we had psychologists from the United States coming over and the seminars, and it's sort of like all of a sudden trying to, you know, it really brought home to me what it's like to sort of live in an intellectual vacuum. And, you know, you always think, well, can, can people come up with all of these ideas on their own without going <laughs> course to other people? But it really sort of highlighted to me how helpful it is to have all sorts of different uh, ideas and theories floating around and how that helps you. You know, you might not even agree with them, but it still helps you mm -hmm. get what you're doing. Yeah. 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 So, so you know, that was really interesting. Um, when the, the sociologist was trying to conduct the first large-scale sociological study of sort of what he called homo Sovietic consumerism. So what is Soviet or Russian citizen like? What? So, you know, but they had nothing to build on. Usually you would go to one sociological study of the passwords, but one in the end before. So. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that was interesting is that he had this sort of notion that you know, after so many years of sort of totalitarian control, we have a certain kind of citizen that has developed because this mm -hmm. is the kind of citizen that's going to be able to survive well in this kind of society. Mm -hmm. And, you know, someone who just sort of knows their place and you know, just sort of accepts what's going on. And he had this notion that, okay, this generation is going to you know, die off and then the next generation is going to be different. Mm -hmm. What he found as he conducted these surveys is people started moving away and away from that way of being. But then, with all the chaos that was going on in the nineties, people really wanted stability, mm -hmm. and which, of course, then was what appealed to them about Putin. And they started going back towards the way they were. I guess that was had such a that, strong. That I mean, that sort of yeah. way of being had such a strong hold that it was sort of intergenerational yeah. and. You know, they really wanted to go back to that. It doesn't matter if I don't have as many freedoms. I want stability, and I want a strong leader, and I want to know where my place in society is. I don't want to feel this pressure to be an entrepreneur or whatever. Um, the uh, psychoanalyst talked about how much anxiety people <coughs> felt in the 90s and, and you know, pre Putin. That for them, you know, for her freedom was suddenly this new possibility and this exciting opening up of options, whereas for a lot of people it was just causing anxiety. So just that was that was interesting to see. Um, the other thing that uh, I took away from this that's really interesting is at the end around 20 11, 2012, 2014 is when we started really getting the anti-gay legislation coming in. Mm -hmm. And this surprised me. They had people coming over from the United States. So people who had been involved in um, you know, Save the Family kinds of groups in the United States that were anti-same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. Some of people that were like opposing People that I can't remember, probably since we ate in California, I can't remember which is which because I went back and forth. But, you know, they they wanted they didn't want there to be same sex marriage in California, so they were involved politically mm -hmm. on that side of the issue. I think that was the pro proposition. Some of these names I, I actually recognized, and I can you know I had to go back and look up in Wikipedia to see why I recognized them. But these people are now going over to Russia and counseling and speaking at conferences in Russia and, you know, telling the Russian government, you can avoid the mistakes that the United States has made by <laughs> instituting these, uh, you know, laws. And, you know, some of these people are people that have been sort of basically disavowed by the American Psychological Association, the American Sociological Association, you know, association. Um, so, you know, there's a lot more uh, <laughs> cross-fertilization of ideas than I think I was ever aware of. Um, a sort of self-trained uh, self philosopher uh, 
And then she follows. Yeah, yeah. we're just doing all this reading of these subjects where there's really intelligent people. He read, 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 mm -hmm. read all these people. Um, but he ended up going sort of a nationalist, sort of right mm -hmm. wing direction, and mm -hmm. he counsels people. Yeah, and this is one of those things you read one book on the topic, and all of a sudden you start seeing things coming up in the news that mean no, something to do it. Yeah. And so he's someone that Richard Spencer mm -hmm. uh, reads. Mm -hmm. um, there's some article in the New Yorker about France and their sort of uh, nationalist uh, far right movement, and he shows up in that article. <laughs> so um, reading this book was sort of an experience of wow, you know. Yeah. I've only read one book that only gives me one little perspective, but even that yeah. all of a sudden is covers so many. I've seen yeah. all these things that mean something to me all the time. All right. On that note, <laughs> <laughs> reading is good. You will learn things and expand your horizons. Let's make it positive. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully, we'll learn from it. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, it's interesting because now the author, of course, now lives in the United States because uh, uh, she can't no wonder. She can live in Russia. She says the regime. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And she's being interviewed by, she, like, I've heard her say she's got all these. Suddenly, she's got all these special skills that are really of interest. And <laughs> <laughs> specialized knowledge. So people are always asking her, well, you know, what's the secret or what's that? How do you, you know, fight authoritarianism? And she's like, well, obviously, I did a really good job of this. <laughs> I so much, so now I'm really here. So I really don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We didn't, Obviously, we didn't, didn't successfully do that. I didn't have the right answer. Yeah, yeah, I'm not the right person to ask. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Well, that is our last uh, official title for it. Um, yes. All right. Um, so that is just a sample of some of the things that we have done on um, uh, Friday reads. What I'm going to do is actually pop out to the website to show you. Let's see what we have. So um, from the commission's website, as I said, this is something we do every Friday. So you'll see something like here is this um, last week's, as Amy said, if we do this again, analysis on again, you'll be number one. <laughs> so this week we'll be right about next year. But this is the post that Amy uh, did about our year in review. I just want to show this to you to see. Um, nice little collage that I that it's our graphic and it's great. Yeah, of all of the book covers for this year. Um, but we have um, in our blog, this goes to um, where you can get by the tag within our blog all of the different um, titles that have been posted that have to do with Friday Reads, if you want to scroll through it that way. Or we had created a page where all of the book reviews are collected here. And you can search, whoops by fiction or nonfiction, um, if you're um, have a preference for what you read. I don't know, Susan, both of your books are nonfiction, is that yeah. what you prefer, or is it just happening? It to be, seems it's just coincidence. <laughs> a lot of yeah. So, and then this will link you directly to each one. So if you're interested in um, uh, looking for a particular title that you know you maybe heard about that we did, or you want to see what some particular staff person here would be. And this is everything, this isn't just, this is going back to the beginning. Um, which, as I said, was about three and a half years ago when we first started this program. So I definitely take a look there to um, see all the other titles um, that we have um, reviewed. And keep an eye on that every Friday. We've got a schedule through, um, I don't know, we've got things scheduled through this happened through this year. I, don't I think so. We do about that. four months at a time and then we yeah. reevaluate. Mm -hmm. Hopefully bring in some more people yes. to do it. So we'll have um, hopefully different people. When we did this, um, we actually did a session about this um, about a year and a half ago, um, and we had a whole different group of people on. Um, I don't know some. Here's ours, I think. Yeah, some here's ours. Sam show is on those, I think. So um, next time you may see a whole different group of people, depending on who volunteers. Again. So um, so yeah, so that will wrap it for today's show. Thank you very much, uh, Sally, Alice, and Amy, Susan, and Krista. Um, <laughs> for being here for today's show. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, this is going to be on our Encompass Live website, which I'm gonna to go to right here now. Um, 
These are our upcoming shows, but our archives all go here underneath our upcoming shows. And today's will be at the top of the list. Most recent ones are always at the top. Um, we will have um, this recording will be up there and a link to the presentation um, included in the description will also be a link to the um, page where you can search all the reviews as well. So um, anyone who attended today or who registered for the show will be sent an email automatically letting you know that it's available and it will also be posted to all of our various um, communication venues. Um, Encompass Live, um, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So um, when I post a recording, go ahead and look at it, share it with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, any topics you think anyone may be interested in. Um, and they can come and sign up for our upcoming shows or watch the archives. So I'll be doing this next week when we just got into our schedule here, Dazzling Displays. Um, Denise Harders is the director of our Central Plains Library System. We have four regional systems here in Nebraska, and she has a presentation about doing displays. Um, every month or so, she actually sends a, a um, an email message out to her system. Um, I, I display ideas for the month. Um, the popular topics, um, is it going to be National Bacon Day? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I think it just happened. Oh, oh just inside. <laughs> Everyday National Bacon Day. Well, there's yeah, certain things you can be very creative with, yes. Um, but so she has a presentation about these displays that she does. So um, as you can have some ideas and tips and tricks on how to create your own displays and how this is a, this is a, um, uh, passive programming technique actually and how to use that to um, get um, people interested in a certain topic um, rather than a specific program that they attend you kind of um, subconsciously create something they'd be interested in and increase circulation of your library materials your books your movies whatever it is you want to that you can do with displays so she's going to talk about passive programming and displays and give you some ideas so um, definitely sign up for that one and any of our other shows you see coming up here um, we've got some more dates coming in February to fill in. I'm going to talk to people, so we'll see if the schedule is filled in. So do you sign up for anything else on there that are coming up. Also, Encompass Live is on Facebook. If you're a big Facebook user, give us a like over there. I post, I post here reminders. Here's a reminder to log into today's show. Um, when our recordings are available, I post on here. When you have new things um, added to the schedule, I add them on here. So if you are um, big on a uh, user of Facebook, do give us a like over there to keep up with what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Other than that, that wraps up the show. Nobody had any questions or comments? That's okay. Thank you very much for listening to our reviews. Um, I think they're also very interesting books. I always, when I um, when read these kind of shows, Sally does sessions on children's and youth books. Um, I always get ideas for things that either I want to read for myself, which just adds to my pile of things I haven't read, or ideas for other people. So I've actually got some ideas here, some things that I might get from books from my sister or my um, other sister-in-law's kids. So. <laughs> so we hope that we can have some good ideas. And that wraps up for the show. Okay, right. thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. I'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye bye. <laughs>